So now we go on to P4, and having done P3, which as I told you was the largest task, things do get considerably easier from now on in. And you'll notice that we've actually crossed the halfway point. So, so far, we've managed to get uh, P1 done and dusted over here. Uh, P2, you've done, and M1 you've completed, and you've just about finished P3 now. So this means that we're left looking, and in fact you've done M2 as well, come to think about it, so that's uh, five down. So we go on to the sixth one out of 11, just to situate you on where we are, and that's this fellow here, which is creating a flowchart and describing the purpose of the game. So those are the two things that you're gonna need to do once we get into P4. So let's have a look at the detail here on uh, how we're gonna do that. This from the specification, learners are required to produce a logic structure for their game concept uh, using suitable documentation identified in the teaching content. All right, so uh, let's go on and have a look then at the, uh, at the teaching content, see what that tells us. Uh, the logic structure should comprise of a clear definition of the objectives of the game, uh, that's this fellow here, um, and a flowchart showing the flow of the game. So this particular task is broken down into two separate elements, one being the definition of the objectives of your game, and the second one, um, a flowchart showing the flow of the game through different levels. And then it goes on to say here, through single or multiple layers with single and multiple players, you're perfectly within your, within your rights to make a, a, a one-player game which will show one level. That's the expectation here. So uh, if you want to go further and create something more, that's entirely, um, entirely your choice, but it's not necessary uh, to do that. So how can we achieve these, uh, these two subtasks? Well, I think the first way is by looking at the, uh, we'll come and look at the, at the flow chart a bit later on, but I want to focus on the purpose of the game itself. So let's have a look at this from, a, from an overview. When we're looking at the purpose of the game, let's look at it from the purpose of Greenpeace, who's our client, who's asked us to make the game, and then uh, from the context of the player, him or herself, playing the game, the purpose of the game when you play it. So that's the first two ways in which we break this down. People always want to know how much they have to write. It's a dreadful question, but for this task, you're gonna make your flowchart, and this piece of writing for the purpose I imagine will end up being about one and a half sides, something like that. One and a half to two sides is what students have generally produced, sometimes more and sometimes less. But it's not a question of how much you write, it's about the quality of what you produce and whether or not you tick all the boxes um, uh, within that task. So the client asked, um, if you look back at the brief, the letter you've got, uh, the client asks that the game has got educational content, that it's fun, it's easy to play um, and hard to master, and that it's for a specific audience. So how have you addressed those? That's, that's the purpose of you making a game or the purpose of them asking you to make one. And then we'll go on and look at the end user and think about the game, uh, the game's purpose in terms of rules and play. How do you play it? What are the rules that, um, that constrain the way in which the game's actually played? So let's start with the client. What will the player learn over the course of the game? This is where you'll think about your campaign that you've chosen uh, and what the actual learning material will be that you're drawing from that campaign. And then the other stipulations that the client made uh, within this brief, uh, they were that the, the game was easy to play, that it was for a specific target audience, and, uh, and also think about the greater context of the game why are you doing it? You are doing it to make the world a better place, to stop um, global warming, to uh, which is a bit of a grand, a grand aim. But that's that is part of what you're actually trying to do here. Okay, so think about the greater context of the game um, as well. You might recognise this list. This is one that I showed you when we were writing P1 uh, three or four weeks ago. And this list is a pretty solid starting point for the kind of areas you need to cover for this task. What's the uh, purpose of the game? Who are the players? What do they do? What about the NPCs? What purpose do they have? Are there achievements in the game? If so, how do they move it forward? Uh, is there attainment in the game? How do you maintain a player's interest? What's, how do you progress in the game? And is there competition? And also, how do you play the game? Is it keyboard? Is it uh, joystick? And so on. 
So let's jump in now and have a look at the purpose of the game in terms of some of the questions you should think about. So first of all, is there a narrative or story behind the game? I showed you some previous students' work. I can remember there was a student who was a, a very keen eco-warrior and he created a character who was a very strong eco-warrior and he had a desire to improve the lives of the orangutans, for example. Um, what's the goal of the game itself? How do players achieve the goal of the game? What happens if they fail to achieve it? Um, when they achieve their goal, what happens and what obstacles have they got to overcome? And again, we're back to Bernard Suits and this idea of willingly overcoming unnecessary obstacles. What are the unnecessary obstacles in your game? What happens when you overcome them? What happens when you don't overcome them? And most importantly, what is the win state of the game? That clearly needs to be included. Um, going into a bit more detail on your, on your character, What's the character's purpose? What's the character's purpose within the game? Um, why does the character, character exist? And how does the character link to the overall purpose of your game and the brief that you were given? There may well not be achievements in your game, but if there are, and this is an example of the types of achievements we looked at before, what achievements exist in your game? How do you get them? And in what way do they uh, do they impact on the game? How do they improve the game? So talk a bit about your achievements if you've got them in there. Um, we've got attainment, succeeding. We're talking about points, score, um, multiple levels. And don't forget, you've only got to make one level. So describing one is absolutely fine. How do you know when you get to the end of the, of the level? Does it get harder? Um, is there a boss battle at the end? Unlikely in your case, but possible. It's entirely, um, it's entirely up to you how you make this game. Um, it's unlikely that you're going to have time to introduce things like updates or challenges. Uh, maybe there's competition through high score. Are there secrets within the, within the game? If you have the time, it would be a fun thing to do. But bearing in mind, you've got two weeks to make this game. So uh, it, it can't be too much of an expectation that you have these kinds of elements. But if you do, describe what they're there for. Does the challenge increase as the game um, progresses? And it may well be for you just to talk about how in level two, it'll be happening faster, you've got less time, um, there are more enemies and so on, however you want to uh, approach it. Very, very short sentence just to describe how the characters play. It'll be a keyboard, that's what you'll be saying and which keys to use, I guess. Um, progression, how do you progress? Uh, what do you need to do to score points? How do you get to the next level? Make sure you've included these elements in your description of the purpose of your game. And do you get better over time? Um, we talked about high scores. Is there a community? There won't be yet. It's a, it's a, it's a beta game. We haven't even made it yet. But uh, these are things that you might wish to consider. But again, this list, this is a long list. You certainly don't have to include all these things. But we do need to know some of the key elements about the game that you're making it and don't forget this is an awful lot like p1 and m1 except rather than describing three games you're describing your own plus you're putting in a flow chart that's really another way of looking at it so that gives you a really good idea of what you need to do for p1 like i say most people end up producing a side and a half to two sides of a4 and then they produce their flow chart on top of that so next step is to think about your flowchart. Now, I'm gonna draw your attention to what's requested of you in the specification because it's something slightly different from what you've done before. So if you have a look up here, and this is the exact wording from the spec, a system flowchart showing flow of the game through single multiple layers with single multiple players. Well, that part you can forget because it's the part of the level that you're making. But the key thing is showing the flow of the game. So it's about how the game is played. So through different levels uh, and so on, and through different obstacles. So that's the, that's the area of focus of this flowchart rather than anything more technical. It's actually how the game is played. So it's a slightly different use for, uh, for this particular diagram. Now to that end, don't forget about the, the flowchart uh, symbols you need to use. And also don't forget the flowchart rules which quite a few of you uh, got wrong last time, insofar as we've got the start, the end, and there can only be one start and one end. Then you've got the arrows that join things together. 
And then you've got the input and the output, which is the parallelogram, which I struggle to say. And then you've got the processes, which is the rectangle. Now, something that caused some confusion last time was this last one, the decision box. And don't forget that generally, or always, you have two things coming off the decision box. And one is going to say yes, and you have a little rectangle up here saying yes, and a little rectangle here saying no. And you write your question inside the box here. And that's what we're looking for with those decision boxes, if and when you use them. Uh, there were some quite strange uses of that box uh, in Unit 6, so make sure that you that you get that right this time. So that's your flowchart, and don't forget the key rules are one beginning, one end, everything must join together, so you can't have orphaned boxes over there somewhere, it just doesn't work, um, and the thing has to make sense. It has to actually represent what your game will look like. So to that end, here is one that was made uh, a year or two ago. Again, this is not perfect, and don't use this as the basis for yours because this is a, this is a different game to the one that you're going to make. But you can see that it's got the levels over here, and you can see that we've got this idea of, uh, in this case, it was planting trees, and level one goes on to level two, and then level three, and then you've got level four over here. You've got the main menu here, some information on how to play the help files there. So that was the uh, one version that we saw. This next one is an awful lot prettier, um, not necessarily better, and a better use of, uh, of the symbols, although you can see again here, this student decided to use the decision box in rather a weird way. We don't know what is yes and what is no, but at least it was the right, the right box. I did like the fact uh, he used these curly arrows, that was rather sweet. But again, does it give you an overview of how the game is played, the flow of the game? That's what we're looking for um, in this flowchart.